snow joes. Even in the coldest, most barren tundras, there's a phenomenon that can shatter the frozen silence and stillness. It's called an avalanche! And when this avalanche starts rolling towards you, you better make like Tomax. Or was that Samot? And retreat! Now I've been a Snow Joe since 1982, a full year before Snow Job was even released. I had no issues with my Joes wearing OD green while doing battle in the snow. But boy, did I prefer it when they were dressed in Arctic white. And the Snowcat is one of my all-time favorite vehicles of any toy line. I had countless battles and adventures with that frosty half-track in both the warmer, greener months and on my kind of turf in the cold Canadian winters. I thought it was the ultimate snow toy. I had wanted an avalanche for a while, but because it was released in 1990, well after the G.I. Joe Sunbow run had ended, as well as my days of playing with toys outside, temporarily at least, I never pulled the trigger on it. I thought it would be neat to have, but I had no idea, no idea, just how vital it is to a Snow Joe convoy. This isn't just part of my Joe's Arctic forces. This is the centerpiece. It's the flag for your aircraft. It's the Joe HQ for your land vehicles. I never thought the Snowcat and the Polar Battle Bear could look better until I had them flanking the ultimate Snow Joe vehicle the Avalanche. And I want to give a big frosty thank you to good brother Adam Hurt for gifting me this amazing piece of snow toy artistry in an epic Christmas gift box. I almost didn't want to take one in such magnificent condition out into the harsh Canadian tundra. But it's the kind of stuff our avalanches eat up like candy. You got that right, Sub-Zero. Now you know how I am about unfinished business. This baby was born to roll out over snow and ice. And much like with other Snow Joe vehicles, it makes the winter surroundings look so much prettier by just being there. I guess the reason I slept on it for so long was I figured how good could it be if it didn't even have an original name? Avalanche had already been used for a Battle Force 2000 member in 1987, which I did have. Good old Sergeant Ian Costello. By 1990, I was getting the feeling that the creativity and care wasn't going into the figures and vehicles that had been put into them in the 80s. Well, when it comes to the Avalanche, you're looking at a tank that feels like it fits right alongside the Mobat and Mauler. The only animated footage of it that exists is in the Deke cartoon. which obviously isn't going to get many Joe fans very excited about it. And it didn't have much to do in the original Marvel Joe comic run, but where it first caught my eye was in issue 167 of IDW's G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero comic, the continuation of the classic Marvel series. It's shown kicking some major Cobra butt before succumbing to a fatal wolf bite. The issue also featured the Avalanche's driver. Codename? Cold Front. Avalanche Driver. File name, Donahue Charles. Primary Military Specialty, Avalanche Driver. Secondary Military Specialty, Fire Control Technician. Birthplace, Fort Knox, Kentucky. And the bio reads, Cold Front was born so close to Fort Knox, he was breathing diesel fumes from the old M60s as his cradle rocked to the distant concussion blast from the turret guns on the Shermans. Growing up, Cold Front became interested in the tanks. He studied many tactics and strategies from the Korean War to the present. When he was 18, he enlisted in the Army, and because of his knowledge of tanks, he was assigned to the 3rd Armored Division. There he gained valuable experience before he was reassigned to G.I. Joe's Arctic Patrol. He became such a crackerjack tank driver that General Hawk put him in charge of the meanest tank ever to rumble through the tundra, the Avalanche. And the quote reads, Cold Front cannot allow himself to drive a car because he'll destroy it. A well-built station wagon lasts about two weeks in his hands and is usually not salvageable for parts. After he was pried out of the wreckage of his last civilian vehicle, he remarked, I keep forgetting they're not tanks. Cold Front never made an appearance on the Deke animated series, but he is mentioned in the episode titled The No-Zone Conspiracy by Sergeant Slaughter. 
Cold Front, I want you to stick with me! Cold Front included three accessories. A handgun, white, obviously, so if you dropped it in the snow, kiss it goodbye. A tiny yellow visor that could be removed from his helmet. And probably the most infamous of all removable mics. White again, obviously. Oh no! Oh, there it is. Phew. This is a rare case where I wouldn't have minded neon green accessories so much. And Cold Front's biggest accessory, you could say, is the avalanche itself. You won't be losing this white titan in the snow. It lives up to its moniker of tank with a bunch of heavy artillery. Every tank needs a cannon, and this one had a full swing, ammo regenerating freeze blast cannon that could go up and down, and had a turning end to it. It was attached to the side swipe missile firing pulse cannon, which could fire a missile with a push of a button. You know how so many toy boxes had the disclaimer, weapons do not really shoot? The Avalanche had one that said they did shoot. And man, did they ever. It may have come out in 1990, but it was equipped with unsafe 80s spring-loaded action. And the other part that really did shoot was the digitally accurate ice mine deployer. Now I've seen this gimmick on some other toys at the time, like Laser Optimus Prime, being able to launch discs, and they could be a little underwhelming, but the one on the avalanche is awesome. You just have to pull the lever across and it fires black ice mines all across the tundra. Yes, thank Lucas, they're black. It's actually really fun to try to see how far you can get, especially on a flat, icy surface. That's not all though. On either side were a trio of heat-seeking, high-impact surface-to-air missiles that could rise up from the body of the tank. Unlike a lot of previous missiles on Joe and Cobra vehicles, which had to be plucked off and hurled at the oncoming enemy, these could be launched as well, even though no spring action was involved. Instead, it used the power of the flick, and you could get some impressive distance on these as well, thanks to the perfect tolerances between missile and launcher. You'd think that would be enough, even though it could easily steamroll over Cobra vehicles, the Arctic, certain terrain couldn't be traversed even by the avalanche. So in those cases, an attack craft piloted by another figure could separate from the tank. And it separates incredibly easily too. No fear of cracking a tab like other vehicles that had removable drones. On the Deke series, it's similar to the Shark, capable of both flying as well as going underwater. Arctic Submarine. What an awesome bonus. It was also smooth enough to skim along snowy surfaces, but it wasn't only intended for recon. It packed quite a bite itself. A pair of heat seekers, just like the tank portion had, could pop up from the rear and be launched with a flick. Yo, no! It wasn't just about artillery though. It was about artistry too. Tons of wonderful sculpted details all over the tank and drone, especially the cockpits. Check out this funky steering stick. It's kind of like he's riding one of those low-riding West Coast choppers bikes, plus plenty of head clearance for the figure. And love that icy blue tint on the canopy. It looks so beautiful out in the snow. Same goes for the drone. It's got two little sticks on either side for the pilot to grip. Amazing tech detail inside and the same kind of tinted blue canopy, plus some hover jet detailing underneath. And it's an absolute blast taking it out for a ride in the tundra. The tank as well. For me, collecting isn't just about the collecting, the procuring and then placing on a shelf. It's about the experiences as well. And my most cherished G.I. Joe experiences were outside. The old saying really is true, better late than never. I may not have had this white wonder in 1990, but I've got it today. And I had so much fun bringing it to life, leaving track marks all over this winter wonderland. I'm always saying get outside, get some sun and fresh air. Maybe it's easier to sell that by saying, take your toys outside. Grab some pics or video and share it with your good brothers and sisters worldwide. Give them something fun to look at on the internet. Now that's using social media in a positive way. 
Plus, you'll get some sun and fresh air, even if you weren't trying to, and even if it was freezing cold. And trust me, it'll do wonders for your attitude. Now we know. And knowing is half the battle. Hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it. Thank you once again, Adam, for the avalanche and for the very special memory of one more vintage style Snow Joe adventure. I also want to give a big thanks to Carson of 3D Joe's. His online database of G.I. Joe box art, file cards, and blueprints is an invaluable resource to Joe fans worldwide. Want to help keep it rolling? Consider picking up some of Carson's posters on the 3D Joe website to help fund the hosting fees. I just picked up some more myself and I'm so stoked to have full-size G.I. Joe Defiant and Terror Drone posters on the way. They're top quality, made with great skill, much love, and the prices are amazing. There's also the 3D Joe's books, collecting the art of G.I. Joe, most of which are now only available digitally on iTunes, iBooks, Amazon, and Kindle. But that glorious hardcover that's on the horizon. Thanks to the Patreon tribe for keeping this channel going. Your support is much appreciated. And a warm welcome to our newest general, Jeff Barker. And thank you to our newest general level member, Mr. Tin Min Pin. Thanks for the extra energon. And thank you, Jody May, for your extra pledge as well. Feel free to leave a snow comment below, tap the bell for new vid and tell, and to join the tribe, defrost, subscribe. Yo, snow!